scripture reading this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 14 through 18. Here we have Jesus speaking throughout it. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and have the power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. And let us now go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us this day. May my words be your words, and may we have the courage to listen to your words and put them into practice, now and always. Amen. Before I begin, I do want to thank everyone for being so welcoming to me today. The PNC has been wonderful, and if they are in any indication what this congregation is like, then I am very happy to be here indeed. I, I do feel, I, I do feel I need to take a moment to thank Marshall personally, especially for his introduction this morning. Of all the introductions that I have ever received in my life, his was, without a doubt, the most recent. <laughs> Today we are looking at a scripture in which Jesus calls himself the Good Shepherd. A shepherd was extremely important to the welfare and the well-being of a drove of sheep. The shepherd would make sure that the sheep stayed together, would make sure that they're fed. He would fight off predators to keep the sheep safe, even sacrificing himself to make sure that the flock was protected. Because a shepherd would do anything to protect the sheep, they became his companions, and it was second nature to the shepherd to put their lives ahead of the own. So when Jesus called himself the Good Shepherd, he was demonstrating how far he would go to protect God's people. He even says the Good Shepherd gives up his life for the sheep. Now if that statement from Jesus wasn't open enough, in verses 17 and 18, he explains that he makes this choice of his own free will. Now of this passage, William Barclay says that few passages in the New Testament New Testament tell us so much about Jesus in such a short compass. He goes on to say that these verses display Jesus' obedience in God, his confidence in God, and the freedom to choose God in the decisions of life. So I want to look at each one of those adjectives. First, Jesus was obedient to God. Jesus, Jesus was on earth because he had a job to do. The behavior, the sinfulness, the selfishness, the willfulness of humanity had caused a huge separation between the people and God. The laws that had been bestowed from God to Moses had become so twisted and nuanced from their original meaning that these laws had nothing to do with how to love God and each other. Instead, the laws became a get into heaven checklist. Also, Israel had taken the notion of being God's chosen nation to such an extreme that they were looking for God's Messiah to come and eradicate their enemies, giving them prominence and their proper place in God's kingdom. Jesus came to change all of that. He demonstrated that God's Messiah came to vindicate with love and forgiveness. He came to show that the best way to destroy an enemy was to make them a friend, showing them copious amounts of the grace and mercy. Jesus came so that we would understand that the law was not an enemy to be feared. It was a guide to righteous living and to being with our loving Father. And he came to show that following the law was important. 
but never to the detriment of human need and understanding. Jesus came to show that being in God's kingdom was more about serving than it was about power. Jesus came to complete a very difficult and important task and to clearly convey what our loving creator was all about. He had to have many skills and resources and tools at his disposal. Jesus had to be a teacher, using allegory and parables and hyperbole to paint a clear and concise picture. He needed to be a healer, performing miracles to help others understand and see God. He needed to be a preacher so that God's message could reach everyone. He also needed to be patient and forgiving and kind and honest and forthright and merciful. Jesus was able to do what he did here on earth because he was obedient to God. His obedience showed a strong faith and it showed an utter trust in his loving Father. It doesn't tell you what to do in seminary when the pages stick. <laughs> Jesus' obedience allowed him to follow God's plan. He didn't argue. He didn't suggest that he knew better. He didn't decide to do things his own way. He was obedient. Jesus didn't come to do what he liked or what he wanted. He came to put his energy and his trust in God, and he always did what God wanted. In his obedience, he knew what a right relationship with God was all about. The second thing we learn about Jesus is that he had confidence in God. Now, my father was also a minister, and he had a saying that he used to instill in his sons when he wanted to build them up with confidence. And this was the saying. The secret in life is to find something you don't do well, and then don't do it. <laughs> this, was, this was my father, and it was his funny way of saying, focus on your strength and work hard to accomplish your goal. We all learn in life that any great accomplishment is usually earned after a whole lot of work and effort. Earning that degree comes after years of study and devotion. Receiving that promotion takes years of dedication. Being a master or an expert in your career takes a lifetime of experience and learning. Being a great athlete takes discipline and training. What we do in life takes work, takes patience, and it takes confidence. Coming to earth as God's Messiah and taking on the sins of the world so that we can be right with God, making that sacrifice so that whoever believes in Jesus will not perish but have everlasting life. Succeeding in that great accomplishment was hard to do. Impossible for me, but for Jesus it was possible because he had confidence. And not just any confidence, he had confidence in God. Jesus knew God was with him. Jesus knew that God would not give him something he was not capable of handling. Jesus knew that God was in the midst of the evil. Jesus knew that God would never leave his side. And Jesus knew that God would never stop loving him. He never ran away from the cross, and he never doubted that God would see him through. And the final piece that Jesus shows in this passage is that Jesus was given the freedom to choose. As a good shepherd, Jesus willingly gave up his life for his sheep. And he chose to do this. We see this in Scripture. In the garden, when the guards came to arrest Jesus, he stopped Peter from defending him. In Matthew, Jesus said that if he wished to, he could call in a legion of angels to save him. And he made it quite clear that Pilate was not condemning him, but that he was accepting death. His hand was not forced. He did not get caught up in the moment. He did not get back into a corner. He did not get himself into a situation, and this was the only way out. He made the conscious decision to choose what was before him. His choice was to follow God's plan for his life, and he never wavered or regretted that decision. I really like what Barclay says when he talks about Jesus as a good shepherd because it shows us Christ's obedience, Christ's confidence, 
and his ability to choose God. And I'm going to do this. Now, the good news is I'm not running away. <laughs> and the bad news is that this means I'm only about halfway done. <laughs> My and again, I like what Barclay says because he says that Jesus was obedient, he had confidence, and he chose God every day. That's wonderful. But we kind of expect that from Jesus. It's, we're not really learning anything new when we know this. So the question is today, is what do we in our life do with that? And so what, what I want to do is I want to talk about how we can be obedient to Christ, how we can have that confidence in Christ, and how we can choose Christ every day in our lives. I want to talk about each one, and the way I want to do it is, I have, as most men do, most fathers do, I have these dadisms in my house. I have tons of them. And I want to use three of them today. They're called dadisms because I say them ad nauseum to my children <laughs> as a way to learn and teach. And I want to use them today, one for each of these three adjectives, to see how we can become obedient, have confidence, and choose God. So the first is we need to have obedience to God. And the first phrase is, at least the first part of the phrase, is probably one that everyone, every parent has said, and everyone has always, has always heard. And I use this with my children when they feel slighted, when they feel disadvantaged, when one of them says, that's not fair. My ism is, life is not fair. But you can be. And it's very important to know that when we're obedient to, obedient to Christ. We can be fair. We can be just. We can be accepting of other people. We can give people the benefit of the doubt. We can live as Christ lived, helping and sharing and caring by being just and fair with who we're dealing with. Christ treated everybody equally and put everyone on a fair and equal footing. And when we're obedient to that, we can do the same. We can be fair. Now the second ism I have, and this is when there's a situation where my children are feeling guilty or frustrated or upset because they've done something or they haven't done something and they don't know what to do next. They don't know how to fix it. They've hurt somebody, they've lost their temper, they've done something and this is very hard for them because they use, Colin's the one that usually says, I have a problem and I don't know what to do next. And so my ism is, remember it's not what you do, it's what you do next. It's what you do next that counts. It's not that you lie, it's that you have the courage to tell the truth. It's not that you were mean, it's that you were able to go to that person and apologize. It's not that you failed, it's that you worked hard and you never gave up. It's not that you crossed that line, it's that you did what was necessary to get back on the right side of that line. When we have the confidence in Christ, we have the ability to always do what comes next. And my third ism that I use is one that I actually stole, I borrowed from, from Tony Campolo, who's been preaching forever, he's in his 80s now. He did a lot of youth ministry and youth in his younger career. And I, years ago, used to take youth groups to see him when he would do his presentations and his conferences. And one of the things that Tony used to say, he'd say when people would come up to me, they always say, Tony, I want to be a great parent, I'm doing my very best. And what it all comes down to is I just want my children to be happy. And Tony's answer was always, I don't wish happiness on my children, I wish goodness on my children. And I say the same to my children, I don't care if you're happy, I want you to be good. If you're filled with goodness, good things will happen. You can be the happiest person in the world and not be a good person. But if you're filled with goodness, you will be happy. Happiness will come to you. When we make that decision, that conscious decision every day to put Christ first in our lives, we are filled with goodness. And that gives us the confidence and that gives us the obedience that we need to live in this world with Christ every day. And it's not just living in this world. When we do these three things, when we make those conscious decisions, we are transformed people. 
And we all, let, let me tell you that transformation. There was a family, an Amish family. I know I maybe didn't touch it. I can say Amish in Florida because nobody knows what that is. But I know I'm not touching you. But there was an Amish family who lived their Amish life for generations and generations. And one day they decided that they wanted to know how the real world lives. What it's like to have electricity in stores and so on and so forth. They decided the best way to do this was to go to a department store. So they did. The, the mother, the father, the two children packed everything up. They went to a department store. They got in the front doors and the ladies took off to see everything that the store had to offer. And the man, the man and his son, the, the father was, was captivated by this big box that he saw in the store. He didn't know what it was, but he was drawn to it. And he went over to the box. And it was a big silver box. And he's staring at this box. And this wee old lady comes up, pushes a button on the box. The box opens up. She gets inside the box, and the doors shut. Now, we all know that she went in the elevator. But this man had never seen an elevator and has no idea what just happened. And he's mesmerized at the spot by this old lady who went and just disappeared. And as he's still staring at the box, a couple minutes go by, and the box opens. And this 22-year-old gorgeous woman, <laughs> this Calvin model, comes out of the box. And his, his, his jaw just drops to the ground. He doesn't even look for his son. He just grabs for him and says, go and find your mother. There's something she's got to try. <laughs> To me, that's total transformation. <laughs> when we are transformed, we are obedient to God. And that means we can be fair. When we are transformed, we have confidence in God. And that means we always know what to do next. When we are transformed, we make that conscious choice to choose God every single day. And when we do that, we are filled with goodness. When we can do those three things, we can live as Christ lived each and every day. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much for what you do and what you say and what you do to us. Give us the courage to do that each day of our lives, now and always.